Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Grand Rounds webinar, the first of the year. We will have questions and answers at the end of the session. Dr. Winnie Armand will be introducing our topic, our speaker, and uh, also sharing our February webinar information. So we'll, we'll have questions and answers, and uh, we'll end promptly at one o'clock. Thank you. Thank you everybody for joining us. It is such a pleasure to be co-sponsoring these educational seminars along with the Center for Climate Change, Climate Justice and Health. My name is Winnie Armand. I am a uh, physician at the Division of General Internal Medicine at MGH and Associate Director at MGH for the um, Environment and Health, Center for the Environment and Health, excuse me. Um, today's topic will be about planetary health, protecting global health on a rapidly changing planet. We're very privileged to have Dr. Myers join us, who I will introduce shortly. I just want to tell you a few more housekeeping issues. Um, in addition to the Q&A, uh, please use the Q&A button. We won't be uh, monitoring the chat function as well, so we will try to get to as many questions as we can, but throughout the, the talk, feel free to enter your questions um, as, as you come up with them. Uh, this is recorded, so you will get an email with a recording link within a few days. Um, so if you need to jump off, uh, you'll be able to finish the rest of the talk in, at your home. So uh, the next slide, please. I will introduce Dr. Maz shortly after my announcement about our next month, uh, next slide, please, uh, which is going to be on uh, the inpatient medicine waste audit and the plastic pandemic with a host of uh, speakers from uh, our institution. And that's going to be on February 16th, 2022. And I do want to say a big thanks to Clint Kairana, who is working hard to put these talks together, uh, and we wouldn't be able to do it without him. So without further ado, I am going to introduce to you our, uh, our esteemed speaker, Dr. Sam Myers. He studies the human health impacts of accelerating disruptions to Earth's natural systems, a field recently dubbed planetary health. He is a principal research scientist at the Harvard School of Public Health and is the founding director of the Planetary Health Alliance. Dr. Myers received his BA and Master's of Public Health from Harvard and medical degree from Yale. He trained in internal medicine at UCSF. Dr. Myers' current work spans several areas of planetary health, including global nutritional impacts of rising concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere, the health impacts of land management decisions in Southeast Asia associated with biomass burning, in particular air pollution, the global consequences of fisheries decline for human nutrition and health, the global impact of animal pollinator declines on human nutrition today and in the future, and the impact of climate shocks on human nutrition as mediated through global food trade. He has published extensively in research articles, book chapters, and including the first textbook in the field of planetary health. As a director of the Planetary Health Alliance, Dr. Myers oversees a multinational effort with over 270 organizations focused on understanding and addressing the human health impacts of disrupting Earth's natural systems. He has received numerous rewards for his work, and we are so lucky to have him join us for this session. Thank you, Dr. Myers. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's really, really nice to get to be here with all of you, and um, I'm excited to get to sort of connect with this community, which I haven't spent much time with. So let me get my slides up. And there we go. Um, so thank you for the invitation to be with you. Um, and I'm going to present what may be a slightly unfamiliar um, uh, frame, which is the planetary health frame, when I think many of you in this community are coming from a sort of climate change and health uh, perspective. And it's not very different but it has a few subtle differences that end up, I think, being important. And so I think I'll be provoking you to um, think about the idea that maybe it's not only climate change, but it's sort of everything changed, that really fundamentally the problem that we're facing globally is just the size of humanity's ecological footprint and that that manifests in a variety of different ways, including but not limited to uh, climate change. I think the first thing we have to do is sort of understand that we are in 
a truly sort of unique moment in human history. There's never been a moment like this one. And by many metrics, there's never been a better time to be a human being. So we've had a lot of human development successes over the last century, you know, metrics of literacy, the percent of the global adult population who can read and write has increased from 42% to 86% since 1940. Uh, the percentage of people living in extreme poverty has dropped from 62% to around 10%, despite nearly a tripling in the global population, which is pretty extraordinary. As many of you know, life expectancy has risen dramatically uh, from 46 to 72, and child mortality has fallen by about a factor of four in that same sort of 65 year uh, time period. But that's the good news. The bad news is that a lot of those really extraordinary improvements in human development in really one person's lifetime have come uh, from the same sort of scientific and technological developments that have allowed us to have this extraordinary sort of ballooning of our total ecological footprint. And it puts us squarely in a piece of time that some people have called the great acceleration, the acceleration in our sort of consumption patterns. These are metrics of global human consumption over time. And what you can see is that really across the board, whether you're looking at appropriation of fresh water or proliferation of motor vehicles or production and use of synthetic fertilizers, paper production, plastic production, primary energy use, they all have pretty similar curves with relatively modest consumption patterns up until about 1950. And then this steep sort of exponential increase in, in what we're asking the planet to provide for us. And not surprisingly, when you look at metrics of our impacts across our natural systems, you see similar curves, whether you're looking at global biodiversity loss or exploitation of fisheries or addition of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, ocean acidification or loss of tropical and also temperate forests. And the reason that all of these curves look so similar is that they're all underlain by these two sort of fundamental uh, phenomena. One is human population growth. So human population was really stable for most of human history. In about 1900, it started to creep up. And around 1950, we saw this really extraordinary increase in the rate of growth of the human population. And at the same time when that was happening, we've seen an even steeper increase in per capita consumption patterns and the amount of sort of goods and services that each one of us is asking our planet to provide for us. And when you multiply those two different things together, you get this really massive growth in the total world GDP. So we're sitting here right now at the top of this almost vertical line in the growth of, of our total GDP. And it's hard to overstate the extent to which the sort of human ecological footprint has ballooned in this process just really over the last several decades. This is a phenomenon of, of sort of right now. Um, in order to feed ourselves, we have converted about 40% of the terrestrial land surface for croplands and pasture. And we appropriate about half the accessible fresh water on the planet, mostly to irrigate those crops. Uh, we are fishing 90% of monitored fisheries at or well beyond uh, maximum sustainable limits. We've cut down around half the tropical and temperate forests dammed over 60% of the rivers, and, and that's actually rising toward 92% in a very short period of time. Um, as you all know, we're experiencing growing sort of global problems of pollution of air, water, and soil, disrupting our global climate. And all of these kinds of anthropogenic environmental changes are driving species extinct at about a thousand times the baseline rate. We've already reduced the size, the sort of number of birds, reptiles, amphibians, mammals, and fishes that share the planet with us now by about two thirds since 1970. Uh, and there are about a million species that are facing extinction, many within the next several decades. So the 
scale of our footprint of, of our impact across our planet's natural systems is truly immense. And in that context, that's why I say it's not just climate change, it's everything change. The sort of core premise of planetary health is that the size of the sort of human enterprise now exceeds our planet's capacities to absorb the waste that we're producing or provide the resources that we're using sustainably. And so as a result, we're seeing our own activities transform the climate system, driving biodiversity loss, altering biogeochemical cycles, changing land use and land cover patterns, driving scarcity of resources like fresh water and arable land, and disrupting the climate system. And that all of those complex systemic global anthropogenic changes are interacting with each other in complex ways to affect the biophysical conditions of the planet and to affect what are really sort of foundational qualities for human health and well-being. The quality of air we breathe, the quality and quantity of food that we can produce, our exposure to infectious diseases and extreme weather events, even the habitability of many of the places that we live. And so that ultimately what we're seeing now are effects across every dimension of human health. It's not only about infectious disease exposure, it's about nutrition, infections, non-communicable diseases, displacement and conflict and mental health effects. And so really across the board, we're seeing growing burdens of disease from global environmental change. I want to tell you just very briefly about a little bit of the research that I do that relates to this to give you a feel for what that looks like and then give you a very quick kind of survey of what do we know about those dimensions of health since many of you are, are clinicians and how they're being affected not only by climate change but by sort of this total global environmental change. So I do research, um, as Winnie said, in several areas. One that I've been working on for uh, over 10 years is how rising concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere are fundamentally making our food less nutritious. And this work is based on research that we've done in experimental plots across uh, three different continents on seven different locations over 10 years where crops were grown using these face rings, these free air carbon dioxide enrichment rings. And so inside these rings, you have a wind direction sensor and a carbon dioxide concentration sensor. And the rings are made up of CO2 emitting jets. And every time the CO2 falls below a prescribed number, in the case of our experiments, it was 550 parts per million, which is about where we expect the world to be around the middle of this century. When the CO2 falls below that level, the upwind jets blow out a little more CO2, and in that way you can maintain CO2 concentrations inside these rings at a prescribed amount. And what's important about that is that using this methodology, you can grow crops in open field conditions. These are not grown in greenhouses or pots, but they're in open fields where the cultivars inside the ring experience the exact same uh, weather and soil conditions and pests and pathogens as the cultivars on the outside of the ring, the only difference being the CO2 concentration. And when we took uh, data from six staple food crops, there are about 41 cultivars of these six staple food crops grown on these seven locations over 10 years, and we pooled all of that data to look at changes in the nutrient content we found that in fact, there were really significant reductions of things like iron, zinc, and protein in particular in uh, staple food crops like wheat and rice and soy and maize. Um, and we spent the next several years sort of trying to figure out what the implications of those changes might be for populations around the world in terms of the health effects. Um, we knew that it was concerning because um, we knew that about 2.75 billion people are receiving at least 70% of their dietary, dietary iron and or zinc from the kinds of crops that were losing those nutrients and that we already had this baseline of around 2 billion people suffering from deficiency. So this is a big global health 
problem today that's likely to get made worse. But we actually had to model the dietary intake of the populations of 152 countries around the world under a rising CO2 scenario to publish this sort of final synthesis paper, which we recently published, showing that in fact, all other things being equal, the CO2 effect alone is likely to push between 150 and 200 million people around the world into new risk of zinc and protein deficiency and is likely to affect about 1.4 billion women and children who are already at high risk of anemia by reducing their iron intake by at least 4%. And so, you know, already these are populations that are sort of on the edge that are now losing their iron intake. And so these are large scale population wide effects. And that doesn't even account for those 2 billion people I mentioned who already suffer from micronutrient deficiencies, whose deficiencies are likely to be exacerbated by this phenomenon. Another area that I've been doing a lot of work is in global pollinator decline. So again, not related so much to climate change, but in this case related to biodiversity loss and this whole concern about what people are calling the insect apocalypse with the loss of insects around the world in particular, in this case, pollinating insects. And we've known that pollinator dependent crops are responsible for a large share of both the calories and the nutrients in the global diet. And we've been doing a bunch of modeling work, essentially asking what are people eating around the world and what are the nutrient contents in those foods? And then using the pollinator dependence of every single food crop in the world, which has been worked out by pollinator ecologists to do scenario analyses. And we published one paper a few years ago in The Lancet showing really significant burdens of disease from pollinator decline so that a 50% loss of pollinator services would lead to up to 700,000 deaths annually, mostly from non-communicable diseases um, because pollinator dependent crops like fruits, vegetables, nuts and seeds, legumes play an important prophylactic role in preventing cardiovascular disease, um, diabetes, and certain cancers. So that was sort of hypothetical work that we did just sort of outlining what is the um, dependence of our health on robust pollinator populations and showing these really sort of significant impacts. We've just finished a new analysis where we're actually, instead of looking sort of toward the future with, with scenarios, we're looking at the present and jumping off of some really important work being done by pollinator ecologists in Argentina who's shown in empirical research across um, farms in Africa, Asia, Latin America, uh, and Europe, that empirically you can show that about a quarter of the yield gap on all of these farms, um, and yield gap is sort of the difference between your farm and the sort of highest potential of what that farm could produce. And about a quarter of that gap is from not having enough wild pollinators around to optimize the yields. And we've just finished an analysis which looks at that yield gap for all crops in the world, how those foods, if they had been produced, would have moved through the global food trade system, who ultimately would have ended up purchasing and consuming those foods based on these bioeconometric models, and then what would the health benefit or the health dividend from those pollinator dependent crops have been. And what we're finding is that we're, we're seeing today about half a million excess deaths every year from insufficient pollination. If we had enough pollinators around, we could optimize our production of those health-promoting foods. So that's just, a, a again, sort of not necessarily an intuitive example of how biodiversity loss may be leading to increased risk from non-communicable diseases across the world. And we're doing similar kinds of work on global fisheries, looking at how ocean warming is changing both the size of fish and the size of fisheries, but it is also changing the distribution of fisheries, moving fisheries away from the tropics and toward the poles, which also is moving them away from the people who most need fish for their intake of critical nutrients. And we found that about a billion people in the world rely on wild harvested fish for sufficient intake of things like iron, zinc, 
vitamin B12, uh, vitamin A, and omega-3 fatty acids. And so um, there's a very large vulnerable population that's likely to be put at risk by big changes in where fish can be found in the size of fisheries as a result of ocean warming. So let's step back for a second and think about this. So we're talking about the effect of global environmental change on nutrition. And I've talked about a couple of areas where my team is doing research, changes in nutrients related only to the CO2 effect. So there are all kinds of other ways that climate change is affecting crop production, particularly yields, but this is about crop quality as a result of rising CO2 and changes related to pollinator declines and fisheries collapse. We also have been doing some work in Madagascar on how declines in wildlife populations might affect nutritional sufficiency for local populations that depend on bushmeat for intake of critical nutrients. But then there are a whole bunch of other ways that environmental conditions are changing that affect nutrition that we don't work on, but other people work on. So how is uh, growing water scarcity going to affect food production? What about arable land degradation, which is having big effects on uh, crop yields? Population displacement, when people are forced to move, you often see undernutrition, malnutrition following as a result of the displacement itself. Ground level ozone is a, actually a potent plant toxin as well as a human toxin and can reduce the yields of crops. And then of course, surprises. And that's a really common theme in planetary health is that over and over you see these complex sort of systems mediated effects that you wouldn't necessarily have predicted in advance because you're changing and altering the biophysical conditions that we've been adapted to and you get these system wide uh, surprise effects. And of course, that's just one dimension of health, of nutrition, but we could do something you know, equally complex for these other dimensions of health. And again, it wouldn't only be changing climactic conditions that would be driving impacts across those dimensions of health, but changing climate on top of all of these other kinds of global environmental change that are altering the biophysical foundation for uh, health conditions. And so let me really quickly uh, try to walk you through a few uh, examples across those dimensions of health. Obviously, uh, we're all very focused on COVID right now. Clearly the COVID pandemic is sort of an example of the um, dangers of a very risky relationship between human beings and wildlife. Uh, it did not probably emerge as a result directly of environmental change. Um, it probably came out of a live animal market in China or maybe a lab accident. Um, but clearly we're seeing these spillover events where pathogens spill over from wildlife populations into human populations as a result of a pretty risky relationship we have with those populations through uh, incursions into wildlife habitat for agriculture or extractive industries, uh, bushmeat hunting, live animal trade. And so we're seeing a lot of emerging infections resulting from those interactions. But there are many other ways that environmental change is driving infectious disease. So um, changes in uh, temperature and soil moisture uh, affect vectors, particularly for vector-borne diseases like malaria or schistosomiasis, changes in land use, um, changes in the composition of biological communities, which alter exposure to things like Lyme disease and other uh, vector-borne diseases. So there are a lot of different ways that we see these impacts. This is an example uh, from Belize, where these farmers are in the uplands in Belize, and they're growing growing their crops, they're adding fertilizer to their land to optimize their yields. But what they don't know is that the nitrogen and phosphate that they're adding to their fields is running off into these little rivulets and then ultimately coming together in streams and rivers and flowing all the way down to lowland baileys hundreds of miles away, where these additional nutrients will trigger an ecological shift in the kind of vegetation growing in these wetland systems. And so this reedy vegetation undergoes a shift from one type of typhal vegetation to another. And that shift favors a particular Anopheles mosquito. And so instead of the dominant vector being Anopheles albuminus, 
Now you see Anopheles vestipanus moving in as a result of that shift in vegetation. And unfortunately, Anopheles vestipanus turns out to be a much more effective malaria vector. And so, you know, unbeknownst to them, these farmers adding fertilizer to their field are actually putting their lowland compatriots at higher risk of malaria through this complex set of system uh, changes. And for reasons that aren't totally intuitive to me, um, meta-analyses have shown over and over that the addition of nutrients and nutrient enrichment tends to increase uh, infectious disease exposure. So that turns out to be a generalizable phenomenon. Population displacement and conflict is another um, area that we're seeing and there's increasing interest in. You know, every year, it seems like we break the record from the UN uh, High Commission on Refugees for the number of displaced people. That was true again this year. About half those people are um, children. Uh, and clearly what's driving all of that displacement is multifactorial. It's not only environmental change, but it's also becoming increasingly clear that um, drought, flooding, crop failures, extreme weather events of other types are all contributing. The greatest um, drought on the instrumental record occurred right before the Syrian conflict. And clearly, you know, governance failures and, and a lot of other issues were at stake there, but it was a contributing factor. And so there's concern that as we continue to destabilize environmental conditions, we're going to see more and more displacement and conflict. And of course, population displacement has a whole host of uh, public health effects from the malnutrition I was speaking about to um, physical, sexual, and psychological trauma uh, to uh, contagious uh, disease uh, and pandemics of um, things like measles uh, and other infectious diseases. And then the non-communicable diseases, and I know uh, Phil Landrigan has spoken to you um, about um, pollution, but, um, you know, one of the big drivers of communicable disease is, in fact, um, an environmental driver is pollution of air, water, and soil. Phil led the uh, Lancet Commission uh, report on pollution and health a couple of years ago that uh, suggested around 9 million excess deaths a year um, from pollution, a lot of those from air pollution. You can see the numbers for um, the contribution to major uh, non-communicable diseases. Maybe a little less intuitive are things like what I was saying earlier about pollinator declines actually setting up increases in mortality from non-communicable diseases. Um, this bottom corner picture is uh, women in Bangladesh who in a time of flooding, uh, we're increasingly seeing uh, higher rates of eclampsia and hypertension among uh, women and, and men for hypertension in Bangladesh. And it turns out that a combination of sort of poor water resource management, but also sea level rise and more extreme storms are leading to saltwater intrusion into coastal aquifers, which is increasing the salinity of the groundwater that they're drinking. And there's, and there's a direct correlation between that salinity and the risk of both hypertension and eclampsia in pregnant women. So again, a sort of counterintuitive mechanism by which environmental change is leading to non-communicable disease exposure. And finally, I think that we give maybe not enough attention to uh, what I think are pretty significant mental health effects of global environmental change. And you know, it's been well established for a long time that the big disaster episodes, things like Hurricane Katrina, are associated with very significant uh, mental health effects from anxiety, depression, uh, joblessness, PTSD, uh, even suicidality. And it's also been established that those effects tend to be quite robust, that if you go back 15 years later, you can still see mental health impacts from that event. And clearly we're seeing just a steady sort of uh, a series of these kinds of uh, extreme events over the last several years. What's less well known is how much burden of disease are we seeing from things like eco-anxiety or ecological grief from the um, concern about 
uh, the state of the world's environment. We're seeing increasing numbers of young couples who don't want to have children and report that part of that is because they don't want to bring children into a world of ecological chaos or they don't want to add any additional ecological burden to the planet. And so clearly we're seeing more and more people around the world carrying a burden from understanding what's happening to our natural systems and feeling very concerned about that. And, and there are lots of examples also, particularly among indigenous communities in the far north or Pacific Island nations and low-lying islands uh, where whole ways of life and cultures are being threatened by uh, environmental change. So if we think about you know, these as the effects of environmental change across really every single dimension of health and really driving significant global burden of disease, and we want to think, what do we do? So, so that's, if that's the diagnosis, you know, what's the treatment? How do we think about solutions? And I think planetary health would argue we need to go way upstream. We need to think about how do we actually change the size of our global ecological footprint? How do we reverse uh, our destruction of these natural systems and regenerate the systems that we depend upon to live healthy lives? And so we need this really fundamental course correction. What we need, I think, are sort of deep, rapid structural shifts in how we live. And there are a whole host of sort of elements to what we call the, the great transition. Um, clearly, yes, we need to address climate change and we need a renewable energy economy and a sort of post-combustion energy economy, but it's not only climate change that we need to address. So there are huge opportunities in thinking about the way we produce food and be much, much more efficient uh, in our ecological inputs, in embracing circular economy and circular manufacturing to re really reduce our use of um, materials, in designing our cities to optimize uh, both physical and mental and cultural health while minimizing the ecological footprint of those cities' inhabitants. And so across the board, there are really, really exciting sort of innovations and technologies that can help us toward that great transition. But there also are probably shifts in the stories that we need to tell ourselves. How, how did we get to a place where the sort of reverence and awe, the sort of spiritual or emotional connection that many of us feel toward the natural world have lost their authority really in guiding our actions? You know, how did it become okay to treat our oceans as a big garbage dump or our atmosphere for that matter? How did it become okay to extinguish species willy-nilly without really mourning their loss? And so the need for sort of new stories about relationship to the natural world and about regeneration um, that will be really central to that idea of a great transition. Um, the good news is that so many of those interventions that I've talked about, particularly for all of you as clinicians, um, are things that would be really good for us anyway. You know, moving towards more plant source diets, you know, embracing more muscle powered locomotion and designing cities around walking and biking instead of around automobiles, developing clean energy sources, which will reduce particulate air pollution as well as addressing climate change. And so there are a host of things that we can do um, that would be good things to do anyway, but that are also really important if we want to stabilize the world's uh, conditions. And I wanted to reflect just for a minute with you on um, sort of the role of clinicians and so many of you are coming from clinical settings and you know my own reflection I uh, as Winnie said direct the Planetary Health Alliance we have a whole initiative called clinicians for planetary health where we work with clinicians um, and we've been thinking about what are the key uh, ways that clinicians can engage around this topic and for me, they sort of break into these four areas. So one is, is sort of this surveillance kind of sentinel role of recognizing changing patterns of disease. You know, if you're starting to see Lyme disease in Maine or you're seeing it moving west, you know, letting, letting people know if you're seeing kidney disease from heat exposure, you know, all the different sort of early signs of environmental change altering the patterns of disease. The second is greening our practices. And I know that you've already had some conversations about that. And I think that's really important. I mean, 
we're not going to address humanity's global ecological footprint simply by you know changing the practices within our clinics and hospitals but it certainly gives us a lot more credibility to move on to number three if we're sort of walking the walk and thinking about how we can work in practices that are greener and, and practices that allow people to walk and bike to get to them and all the other things that you all are familiar with. The third one, which I think is incredibly important, is this role of educating pa patients. If you think about it, probably the most compelling argument for why we should stabilize our ecological footprint, why we should stabilize our natural systems, including the climate system, is that if we don't, we won't have a livable future. That our own health and our grandchildren's health is entirely at stake. And who better to make that argument than nurses and doctors? And on top of that, who are the most trusted messengers all over the world? Nurses, and after them, doctors. And that's not only true in the United States where nurses have been the most trusted messengers for the last 17 years, but it's also true globally. And so, and the last part of that is who touches almost every person on the planet, never mind their politics, never mind their religion, their ethnicity, their geography, how much money they have, who touches all of those people? Clinicians do. And so we're an extraordinary sort of potential workforce to get the message out that we have to redouble our efforts to protect our natural systems if we're going to have a livable future. And so there's an incredibly critical role that we can play as clinicians in doing that. And then related to that is number four, which is sort of movement building and organizing. So at some point, do we step out of our individual roles you know, educating patients and working within our community to think about how we can move into our communities and be a voice among many for organizing to build power. Because some of the problems we're talking about are power problems. We have exploitative industries. We have a fossil fuel industry. We have people making money by destroying our grandchildren's future and extinguishing life on earth. And they're not going to just give away that power without being held to account. And so that requires addressing um, the, the building of power, which is what movement building is all about. And so there's a really important role for physicians in movement building and organizing. And some of you are already engaged in that. And I could learn from you. And there are really important groups all over the world of physicians and nurses that are doing that kind of organizing that we're keeping a close eye on. So finally, um, as mentioned, I direct the Planetary Health Alliance. We would love to have any and all of you engaged with us. You can sign up as an individual to be a member. You can get our monthly newsletter. We're having our next big global planetary health meeting this year back in uh, Boston at Harvard uh, in October. So welcome you to join us for that. Uh, and there are a variety of different ways to get engaged with what we do. And with that, I will stop and take questions. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Myers. That's an incredible talk about an incredibly important topic. And it's astounding to hear about the, um, the incredible, complicated, fundamental connections between the planet and human health, which I think you probably are just scratching the surface for us. Um, so I, I actually have a couple questions of my own while our audience has a chance to start um, putting their questions into the Q&A, and I will pass uh, the mic over to Patrice shortly to help field those. Um, my two questions, one has to do with the uh, big food, big agriculture, so large farm factories, um, you know, getting in, 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 in connection with fast food industries to join forces to promote meat and processed foods. Um, both to the detrimental impact of human health as well as planet health. And I'm wondering what kind of policy changes uh, can help mitigate that and what we can do as clinicians to advocate for our patients who may not have as much income to nourish themselves in an optimal, equitable and affordable fashion. Yeah, so that's a, obviously a huge question and really, really, really important. Um, and there are lots of elements that we could spend hours on, but um, I think um, a few things about that. 
you know, big, in my opinion, does not mean bad. Um, you know, there are, there are some companies that are pretty big now that are um, absolutely at the spearhead of changing the way we eat, like Beyond Meat or Impossible Foods or the Vegetarian Butcher in, in England. And now Unilever is jumping in, you know, with a huge commitment to sell vegetable-based meat um, uh, and or plant-based meats. And I think that's actually an incredibly important development. And the fact that, you know, Beyond Meat is now, you know, I guess two weeks ago announced this deal with, you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken to create, you know, a plant-based chicken or that, you know, when you go to Dunkin', you can get your sausage patty as a plant-based sausage patty. I think that's incredibly exciting. So there are ways that big can actually mean going to scale fast. So if you're doing the right things, it can be terrific. If you're doing the wrong things, it can be really horrible. And you're right that there's a lot of the wrong thing being stimulated. Um, in terms of how you get those industries to shift, well, you know, disruptive technology is what Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods are doing. So they're actually making something that tastes good, that they can produce less expensively, that has dramatically reduced impact on the environment. But most people who go to Burger King to buy their Impossible Burger aren't doing it for the planet. They're doing it because they like the way it tastes or maybe because they think it's better for them. So I think that, that kind of disruptive innovation is important. But I think what you asked what we can do as clinicians, and I think reinforcing um, the message that you know plant-based diets are um, healthier for us as individuals, and they're also healthier for us as a global society and for uh, our planet, which means they're healthier for future generations, um, is really important. And so there are a handful of messages about things that we can do as individuals. So what we can tell our patients, you know, here are things you can do for your own health, because that's really why we're there. Um, but by the way, they're also good for sort of planetary health. Um, and those include, you know, plant-based diets and walking and biking more and driving less and, you know, trying to push for clean energy sources in your community and um, building, you know, neighborhoods around uh, bike paths and greening neighborhoods, you know, all of those kinds of things. So, you know, if we're giving the message that plant-based diets are important, then we're fueling the right kind of change at the level of um, the food world, because there really has to be a signal from for consumers, uh, for companies like Beyond Meat to um, to succeed. In terms of um, expense and accessibility, you know, we I was just part of this um, global panel in England providing sort of policy recommendations um, to governments around the food system. So we've been deep into this. And I think one of the really, really important things that we don't think enough about is that is externalities. And so that's like the cost of a product that aren't in the actual price. And the food system is full of externalities. So when you buy a cheap, you know, beef burger, that's been produced by a cow that required cutting down a piece of the Amazon and releasing carbon dioxide and clear cutting, you know, really important land. And that allowed you to produce this beef really inexpensively. And then you eat it and your risk of, you know, heart disease and a variety of other health effects comes in, which then the rest of society has to pay for. The actual cost of that beef burger is really pretty enormous compared to the cost of you know, Beyond Meat Burger or just a veggie burger or, you know, something else. And, but we don't price those things in. And so one thing we need to do as societies is to start actually pricing foods appropriately to include those externalities. And until we do that, it's going to be easy for companies to push those externalities off onto society. And then it becomes hard for uh, poorer populations sometimes to afford healthier diets and obviously particularly in our inner city populations where you have these food deserts and there's some really exciting work being done and I think that's another thing some of you working in clinics like in Charlestown and some of the city clinics thinking about the food environment that these communities have access to and um, community gardens and all of that so there there are things that I think can be done at the individual level at the community level at the national level and even at the international level to try to address those dynamics, but clearly they're, they're complex and, and also really important.
Thank you for that. I'm going to hog you for one more question, and I promise I will <laughs> let Patrice take it over. I just, uh, this is such a fascinating talk. I, I We could go on. But um, my other question has to do with uh, the diets that we recommend for patients. So tag teaming onto the first one. Um, for years, we've been um, recommending the Mediterranean diet, high in fish consumption. And so then my question is, as we are overfishing and devastating the fish population, um, is that still a diet we should be recommending? And then along with that question, the planetary health diet, where we are to recommend, you know, having meats and doubling fruits and nuts with your uh, talk in the slide about the pollinators diminishing, can we sustain that if we were to recommend that diet as well? Do we have the resources for that? Thank you. Yeah, great questions. I mean, that's, it's really funny you asked that second question because it's literally the question that I'm about to write my next paper on, which is if we actually tried to adopt the planetary health diet globally, as was advocated in the Lancet Commission paper, um, you know, do we have the pollinators present to do that? And I think there's a pretty strong argument that that diet in a global scale recommends between 100 and 200 percent increases in fruits, vegetables, and legumes in order to provide those foods. And how we would produce that when all of those foods are essentially pollinator dependent on our current trajectory is a real question. So we're, we're going to be advocating some policy changes, which are these sort of pollinator friendly practices to allow the robust pollinator populations, which would be necessary to achieve that diet, um, which include things like, you know, banning neonicotinoid pesticides and planting hedgerows around farms and intercropping. And, you know, there are a whole series of techniques the ecologists have identified that will be really important to create, again, the foundation for just the diet that you're talking about. Um, for the Mediterranean diet, you know, I think it's, you know, fish has always been, a, or at least for the last several decades, has been a complicated topic. And, and we get steered towards some fish that we're not supposed to be eating and some fish that we should be eating. And, you know, that changes if you're pregnant and um, there are issues of toxins like mercury and um, there are issues of whether the fish is threatened. And so, you know, figuring out what fish to eat is like a PhD topic for a family. Um, I think we need really good sources of information that are easily accessible for families to go to around fish. And then I think we need to emphasize sustainable aquaculture. And we could really build up access to fish in the diet through um, you know, sustainable aquaculture projects, all the growth in the global fish consumption over the next several decades will be from aquaculture. In fact, wild harvested fish has been falling by about 1% per year since 1988. And so that's gonna, that's in decline because we've overfished. So all the growth will happen in aquaculture and that can either be done in really destructive ways or it can be done in really interesting ways. And there are these mixed systems where you've got fish ponds, but you've got filter feeders like oyster that are actually oysters that are removing uh, sediment and waste from the fisheries. You can have kelp growing or other kinds of seaweed, which you then can be consuming. And so these mixed sustainable systems are really exciting. And I think, again, we should be promoting those just like we should be, you know, having government um, support for. Uh, the protein revolution we were talking about earlier and for innovation and how we produce our proteins, I think support for sustainable aquaculture and how we bring that to scale quickly to provide fish in the diet is a really important topic. And, you know, so I think you can say Mediterranean diet, but I, I think planetary health diet is a great sort of terminology to use, especially if you want to introduce your patients to, well, wait, what's planetary health? And then you can explain a little bit, well, there are these things that you can do for your own health, but they're also good for planetary health. Um, and so the planetary health diet, certainly fish is a part of that as well, but um, can be a, a way to introduce people to these topics. Thank you, Dr. Myers. I was delighted to see that you spoke about Abram Lustgarten's three-part series in the New York Times around the intersection of climate change, conflict, violence, and migration. I think it's a must read for our audience. 
uh, just a comment. And I'll go to Dr. Duhaime's first question. Thanks for such interesting and important research. While the picture is dire, is there any way that climate change might possibly make anything better that can offset the downsides? Um, yeah, I mean, I've been asked that before. There, there are, um, you know, if, if it, it sort of depends who you are, right? I think at a global scale, not really, right? I mean, there, there are not a lot of ways because we've, we're coming out of a 10,000 year period of the development of human civilization called the Holocene, which was sort of characterized by these very, very stable biophysical conditions, remarkably stable biophysical conditions. And we're now changing all of those conditions at by far the fastest rates in the history of our species. And that's not what we're adapted for. And so it's not just sort of coincidence that these changes tend to be mostly bad for us. We've optimized our food production system for current biophysical conditions. We've learned to live in these conditions and it's part of why we've been so successful is because they've been so stable. So you know, are there certain populations in, you know, Canada that will see, you know, improved agricultural productivity as things warm or, you know, certain elements of climate change? I mean, for example, there's a Republican senator, I forget his name, who's been talking about how great climate change is for food production, but he cherry picks the single effect, which is that carbon dioxide can have a small fertilizing effect on plants and improve their growth. What he doesn't say is that with the carbon dioxide, you also change the climate and have these really large negative effects on global yields. And so you can sort of try to cherry pick elements of climate change and say, well, that might not be so bad. Um, but as a, as a package, um, the scale and pace of anthropogenic environmental change, the climate and other systems, it's hard to see that as a net benefit. It's, it's terribly destabilizing to human society and the rest of, of life on Earth. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Myers. The next question is, how do we balance the ecologic effects of population increases with the economic models that rely on growth? I love that question. Um, and I love it because I get so frustrated that there are so many articles. It's always, it's essentially the same article recycled over and over and over again in the New York Times, in the Guardian, in, you know, The Economist, that is about this huge problem we face around stabilizing population or falling population rates. And there was another one in the Globe, I think two days ago about China. And there is no question that, you know, we are starting to see a slowing of human population growth and that it's likely to lead to a plateau and then a downward trend in the number of people on the planet sometime over the next 50 to 100 years. There's also no question that that presents sort of economic challenges in the short term, that having an aging population with a smaller young population to support them is absolutely a challenge. And it's one that China is deeply worried about right now. Mm -hmm. But it's also temporary, right? Unless you want to advocate that the human population just grows forever, which we simply know we cannot manage as a planet, then at some point, the population has to either, you know, stabilize or start to fall. And there's going to be a period of whatever it is, 30 to 50 years in there, where you face that challenge of an aging population. And then you have a new demographic structure, which is, which is stable. And I also think that, so, so yes, there's an economic challenge with that. I also think it's really important to be very clear that what I'm saying when I talk about the great transition, about the need for deep rapid structural shifts in how we live, this is not a message of deprivation. This is not, we've got to stop consuming things and we've got to put on our sweaters and turn down the heat and um, you know, live with less. It's a message that we have to live very differently. 
you know, if we can get to a carbon neutral energy economy, then we can use lots of energy and not be very worried about it. You know, if we can produce food with dramatically fewer inputs, which we're doing through precision agriculture, through the protein revolution, through a whole variety of ways, then there's gonna be plenty of food for everybody on the planet. And so what I actually see is a really exciting sort of aspirational future, you know, 50 to 100 years down the road where the population has stabilized and is falling just as a result of the demographic transition and where we're producing food and manufactured goods with way fewer inputs and where there's actually more and more room for the rest of the biosphere to flourish and to stabilize those conditions that we depend on and where things look as good as they've ever looked. It's just a question of, can we develop the political will to, to drive toward that vision and to achieve that great transition? So um, I don't think this is a story about um, economic deprivation, but I do think that the demographic transition creates sort of short-term challenges with the, the population structure that we'll end up with. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Myers. The, our final question in two minutes that we have is if you could convince leaders to make one change, what would it be? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, I get asked that a lot. I think maybe try to reduce the power of exploitive industries. I feel like there is so much legislative capture, not only in our country, but all over the world where you have these really sort of perverse subsidies for fossil fuel drilling and for other um, extractive industries. And you've got people clearly saying all around the world that they're deeply concerned about the environmental trends that they see. You've got the business community recognizing you know, inaction on climate and global environmental change as the number one threat to the global business economy. You've got like people recognize that we need to move and there's so much stasis and inertia. And I think a lot of that is just this incredible power of these vested interests that have gotten themselves in a position to control you know, government processes. So I don't know how you would do that, but I guess if I was only given one thing I could do, I would try to sort of um, even the playing field so that we didn't have an outsized power in those particular industries. Mm -hmm. Thank you so very much, Dr. Myers. This was incredible, so informative. And everyone's going to now sign up to be part of the Planetary Health Alliance. It's wonderful. All right. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Lovely to be with you. Bye-bye. Thank you.